We put out a 35-minute uh, documentary that we aired during the 28-hour broadcast last week that I shot with uh, Rob Dew and Buckley Hammond uh, in Rome about a month ago. And Leo Zagami, of course, is a documentary uh, filmmaker himself, uh, author, researcher. And I remember seeing his information probably six, seven, eight years ago and thinking, you know, this guy's speculating. I mean, I knew he'd been involved with the Vatican. I knew he'd been involved with some Masons high level, a lot of powerful Masonic groups uh, there in and around the Vatican. I knew a lot of what he was saying was accurate. I don't claim to be a Vatican expert, but from what I'd researched, but, you know, he said the Jesuits will put in a pope. Uh, it'll probably, you know, be the, this particular guy who's now Pope Francis. He said he, him or one other person. Uh, he said that they were going to blackmail with the pedophile scandals that they controlled uh, the Vatican, that they would announce world government. And I, 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 I saw him talk about it. I heard him talk about it. I saw him in Project Camelot, hour-long plus interviews. And people asked, what do you think of this guy? And I said, well... You know, I know they're not supposed to put a Jesuit in as the Pope. And uh, I said, I'll wait and see. Well, we wait and saw what happened. Uh, and indeed, uh, it did end up uh, unfolding that way. And so I want him to talk a, a little bit about himself, but then tell us what he thinks is coming next with all of this uh, with the Vatican. Because even if you're not a Catholic, there are a billion people plus that say they're Catholics. And clearly you can see the leadership of the church has been doing everything it can to destroy the Catholic church. And now that's accelerating. And now the liberal media that is always demonizing Catholics is suddenly praising it as if this guy can do no wrong and is a messiah. And years after Zagami talked about blackmail, to bring in a Jesuit black pope, as he calls it, even the London Guardian had a story basically saying that that had happened. So here is that report. The core of the of what's going on, they are observing us now, Alex. You have to understand, everything that we are saying is being monitored. You know, when the Pope resigned what happened in the Vatican, there was a big storm and there was a lightning that uh, just went on top. You see, like this night, there's a uh, lightning, you see? Experts from the Vatican themselves admitted uh, there is a very close link between uh, pedophilia and Satanism. Then uh, they used to have uh, these ambulances, these fake ambulances parked in front of Termini Station, and they used to pick up uh, these young Romanian kids, 14-year-old kids, and bring them directly into the Vatican. That's just the intro to that piece the demonic possession of the Vatican exposed. It's up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. Now, again, there's a lot of questions I have for Mr. Zagami, but first of those points, I want him to just briefly talk about Pope Francis himself, where he came from, his history, his background, and then, Leo, I want you to break down your awakening, your experiences, and how you were able to predict that they would six, seven years ago, probably longer, time flies, eight years ago, predict that they would put a Jesuit for the first time ever, Pope, in charge, and you were even able to name who you thought it would probably be. Uh, so was that from your larger research, putting pieces together, or did you have inside sources? Because that is really stunning. It's inside sources because in 2005, uh, when we saw in April 2005 uh, the election of uh, Ratzinger, actually Ratzinger was just a minute, uh, but there was already an attempted placing of uh, Bergoglio as a pope. Uh, actually, at one point, they kind of opted on Ratzinger because it was the least problematic choice, uh, because the actual pink pope, uh, Tarcisio Bertone, who was then uh, cardinal of state, was trying to get elected himself. Uh, and so uh, to avoid uh, having Tarcisio Bertone, Cardinal Martini, who is this Jesuit, who actually uh, a few months before he died, in June 
2012, he asked um, Ratzinger to resign. And this is actually been confirmed also by a Jesuit, uh, Jesuit father who then uh, died uh, this year. Uh, he died uh, leaving this uh, testimony. He was the main collaborator of Cardinal Martini, this important Jesuit and Cardinal of Milan. And he confirmed uh, uh, Carlo Maria Martini at one point uh, in uh, June 2012 uh, during the meeting of families, the one that now is going to take place in uh, Philadelphia. He, uh, he went uh, to Ratzinger and said, we can't do really much with the, this Curia, uh, you have to resign. Um, so if the Curia does not reform, it's time to leave. That's the exact words he said that were reported by this Jesuit Silvano Fausti. So basically, here we are talking about facts that are proven. There's plenty of evidence. Uh, this evidence, of course, is not easy to find. Uh, I am an insider. I have my own experience. Maybe we'll talk about this later. But in any case, uh, Pope Francis escalated this time. He failed in 2005, but he eventually got in when the scandals behind Ratzinger made it very easy for the Jesuits to say to him, just uh, uh, go aside because we have to take over the show. This is uh, synthetically what's been happening. Regarding the little girl that you were talking about, uh, you know that guy who picks her up, the bald guy with the glasses, who actually brings her to the Pope, you see her on the image, he's a very important guy. He is uh, General Domenico Gianni. Uh, he is not wearing, his, of course, his uh, inspector general uh, kind of divisa that he has when he's in the Vatican, when he's uh, in America with the Pope. But he's a very high-level member of the Knights of Malta, and he takes care of the Pope's security. Also, it's completely rubbish that the Pope doesn't see TV and he makes this kind of monastic life for himself publicly, because I know from friends of Domenico Gianni that the Pope regularly watches TV and uh, he's like any other guy. They just want to make out of him a saint. The important thing today, after this address to Congress, I think you will agree with me, Alex, is to understand that these people that he actually met Leo Zagami, hold on. Your Skype is breaking up, and, and we have a lot of new listeners tuning in. We can get into the inside baseball on this, but bottom line, we've had a Vatican coup. There had been infiltration. There had been problems before, but clearly there's been a takeover. Uh, after 1,800 years, the most anti-family, globalist, communist, socialist move ever. How are Catholics going to buy this when it's so different and so opposite uh, from what we've heard from other popes uh, and Catholic uh, doctrine. And what is the end game now? What does it signify that the Pope is calling for planetary government, that the Pope is calling for global carbon taxes, uh, and that the Pope is pushing all of this? Uh, what does it mean? Well, it's very clear from mentioning Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. Do you know who these two characters are? These are communists. I mean, Thomas Merton... And Dorothy Day was accused herself of being a communist. He, he, he addressed these two people in Congress. I mean, it's quite obvious what he's doing. Uh, she advocated the Catholic economic theory of distributism, which basically is uh, this uh, uh, communism style that uh, sprang out of uh, the Jesuit creed. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I mean, there is plenty of evidence uh, for this, uh, who, who this uh, Thomas uh, Merton is. Uh, and he was not even that kind of a devout Catholic. He actually converted to Zen Buddhism. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, it's... it's, it's sure, it's and we have a new shocking. Pope uh, pushing ecumenicalism, merging all the religions. What do you make of the headlines I saw last week in the Washington Times and others that there is a conservative rebellion inside the Vatican and that uh, cardinals have been going and warning him? Well, unfortunately, there is, uh, I mean, to this conservative rebellion, a very strong opposition people who we are now seeing in the United States leading the Pope. And one of these people, the key people, is Carl A. Anderson, who led the procession of the Knights of Columbus yesterday during the canonization of the new saint. And he is also one of the main advisors for the World Meeting of Families, uh, which is taking place in Philadelphia. 
So basically, the Knights of Columbus lobbied for this new saint, who you know very well wasn't a saint. He was somebody who was converting people by the whip and the musket, by force. And he had a lot of opposition, even these days, among the Native Americans, which think the whole thing is disgraceful. So this going then tomorrow to the United Nations and blessing basically what is the kickstart for Agenda 2030, seems quite obvious to all of us. Now, for those that don't know what Agenda 2030 is, explain to them how it's phase two of the Global Treaty of Rio de Janeiro, the Agenda 21 program. Well, basically, there is 17 key points, but it's very interesting also to see who has been chosen to actually represent, you know, the various countries and how this whole process has been done. Because John Potesta, who is at the moment... The, the, the key, uh, the, the person who is in charge of the, the whole campaign of Hillary Clinton is one also of the key p persons in this Agenda 2030 that uh, basically will uh, uh, marry uh, fully what the Pope has already announced in Congress and will probably uh, re-announce again uh, tomorrow, uh, amplifying the whole thing in front of the United Nations, that we have all to suffer, we have to pay carbon tax, they can continue getting richer and richer. We have to remind the people who John Potesta is. I mean, we're talking about a person who has been working for Lockheed Martin. Uh, be Stay there, Leo Zagami. Uh, we're going to try to reconnect with his Skype, maybe get him on the phone. Uh, but uh, it's audible. What's important is the information is absolutely key and vital. Stay with us, Infowars.com. Leo Zagami is our guest. I've seen him in countless documentaries. I've, of course, had dinner with him and hung out with him in Rome. Extremely informed. He just rattles off all these names, all this information in Latin. Uh, he took us over to where the uh, Jesuit order is based, where the Knights of Malta is based. And it really is a paradox because I've seen the Catholic Church do a lot of good work, stand up for human life, stand up against communism, stand up against big corporations and globalism. I know it has a checkered past. Any ancient organization would, but I don't just judge people. But this new pope is so aligned with the Club of Rome, so aligned with the UN, so aligned with the EU, so aligned with globalism. He doesn't oppose a, uh, baby selling, baby parts selling. He doesn't oppose any of the big globalist agendas. And now he's trying to get rid of our borders and running stunts with anchor babies uh, this morning on his procession to Congress. And Congress is crying. It's like when we have the Queen of England visit and everyone's fawning and worshiping royalty. I mean, it, it's, an, it, it's a fraud. But this is now religious royalty. When you're at the Vatican, they say, we are the oldest continuing sovereign, you know, uh, leader in the world, tax exempt. You know, supreme ruler of Earth. I mean, it's just like, whoa. And now our Congress is, is bowing down to it. Leo, this is a short segment, long segment coming up. We're going to open the phones up for people. But bottom line, you got cut off by the break. World government, world taxes, UN announcement, uh, this big treaty in December where they're openly announcing planetary regime. In his words, are they making their move naked because they're behind scheduled and they're concerned? Or is it because they think for some reason they're invincible? Because what they're doing is really waking people up, but they seem to be so arrogant. And I look at this pope, he just has a wolf-like look in his eyes that, I, that I've never seen in a pope's face. I mean, Pope John Paul II, people you know, have mixed feelings about, but he was anti-communist. I know you, you've been critical of him to some degree, but he didn't look like a, a raving power-mad Emperor Palpatine. What's going on here? Well, as you know, maybe uh, the liberation theology factor is very important. And actually, Pope Francis was not a supporter, or a supporter in, of any kind of liberation theology during the 70s and 80s. He became, after the fall of the Soviet wall, a supporter of liberation theology like all these mondialist people. It's like they use ideologies just as a tool. And, of course, now the, 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 the communist agenda is on top of all of it. Uh, but um, I don't know if you know about a book that has been, uh, unfortunately, not published in the English language by a, a journalist, an Argentinian journalist called Horacio Verbisky. It's called The Island of Silence. He uh, denounced Pope Francis with a lot of documentation 
that proved that in the 70s he was behind the arrest of these two Jesuits who were later tortured called Orando Iorio and Francisco Yalix. Uh, these two uh, priests, one of them after this experience stayed a Jesuit, the other one actually 